Hi guys, welcome to Brass Bootcamp. In today's video, I'm going to be going through the Grade 5 pieces in Great Winners by Peter Lawrence. The first of the pieces is Solvig's Song. It's a really nice piece, this one. As the title suggests, it's a song, and it also says cantable, which means in a singing style. So the way we're going to be playing this piece is really nice and smooth and tranquil with a really nice rounded sound. So if we have a look at this piece, let's talk about all the theory stuff first. So it's basically split into two sections, this piece. The first section, we're in uh, two flats, so B flat and E flat, and we've got a 4-4 four, four time signature, or a common time time signature, and it starts on beat number four, so when you're counting yourself in, one, two, breathe on three, and then play on four. The second section starts with the upbeat to bar 17. We've got pause, then the second section starts with a double bar, and then we've got a change in key signature, a change in time signature, and a change in tempo. The tempo at the beginning is andante, so that's a slow walking speed, the second section, it goes allegretto, which is slightly faster than that, so it needs to go up one notch in speed. Three, four time signature, so count three beats in the bar, and then our two flats key signature has changed to one sharp, so F sharp. So the next thing, we need to think about what is this piece testing us on, because it is an exam piece, so it's got to be testing us on something. So the first section, it's testing us on a smooth playing, the whole piece is testing us on that, I've already mentioned that, but the dynamics throughout the piece are quite important, especially in the first section. So we've got the first bit of the tune, which is on the first line. It's all piano. We've got some nice crescendos and diminuendos, but they're more of a musical shaping, musical phrasing marking. You don't have to get carried away with those crescendos. Just nice musical shape will really help. Then when the tune repeats on the second line, we've got to go from piano all the way up to forte, and then all the way back down, which is quite a big dynamic change, so we need a nice contrast. And when we're playing our different dynamics, we've got to try and keep the sound the same, the only difference is the volume, the dynamics of the sound. So when we're playing quietly, is the sound pure and not sort of breathy and not fuzzy sounding? And when we play loud, is the sound rounded or is it harsh? So we want that same sound quality from the quiet dynamics to the loud dynamics. So I'll play the first two phrases and try and give as much dynamic contrast as I can. Nice musical shaping, nice phrasing, really clear sound, nice rhythm, smooth in a singing style. So I was really thinking about controlling my air and keeping the sound quality the same at the quiet and the loud dynamics. So just two little notes in that piece. Each phrase, it's virtually the same, but there is one or two little differences. So the first phrase, you'll notice there's F sharp when you get that nice semi-quaver rhythm. And that's, I always think of that as a, like a Scottish sort of rhythm, D down. So the first phrase has got the F sharps. And then when that same phrase happens on the second line, it's actually F naturals instead. The only other difference in those first two phrases is the crotchet G at the beginning changes to two quaver Gs in the second phrase. So carrying on the, through this first section, the second half of the first section, which starts in bar 10 with the upbeat, is testing you on the same things. The dynamic change, you'll notice crescendos from piano up to forte. This little phrase it actually is testing you on your accidentals and your notes, really. Because if you notice, Fs and F sharps, they keep switching between F and F sharp. It also switches between B flat and B natural, and it also switches between C and C sharp. So just watch out, and watch out if there's any of those accidentals which carry through the bar. One other thing in this section, which is a common mistake for many of my students, a lot of the crotchet notes, people don't hold them on for long enough, so they tend to rush through them. At this slow tempo, crotchets last for a quite a long time. So when we're coming from our faster quaver notes to our crotchets, just make sure you're counting those crotchets and holding them on for the full length. So 
So again, really nice sound, really smooth. You've noticed that I'm slurring everything in this piece. You could tongue everything softly, but I think it's much easier and it gets a better effect if you just slur everything and make sure it's really smooth. Because it does say cantabile at the start and it's called Solvig's Song. So in that nice singing style, really nice and smooth. So the final thing in this section is just those grace notes at the last few bars. So if you have a look at bar 15, we've got our little grace notes between the two A's and then in bar 16 we've got the grace notes between the G's. So again, make sure your rhythm without the grace notes should sound like this. So when we're adding the grace notes in, we need to make sure that core rhythm stays the same and we fit those grace notes in between the core rhythm. And the last tip on that one is don't play the grace notes too fast. We need to be able to hear both of the grace notes. And if you play them too fast, it disrupts the style of the piece, I always think. Uh, and also, it just sounds a little bit rushed and out of character for the piece. So this second section, if you just have a look through and we'll just talk about what this section's testing you on. It's pianissimo all the way through. So it's nice and quiet, which makes it quite difficult because it's actually quite high up. So it's all like D's, E's and F's and F sharps. So it's... It's quite high, so we need that arched tongue position, and we can't blow that loud to help us get those high notes. So our arched tongue position and our strength in embouchure really becomes important here. The main thing this is testing you on is, is your counting. A lot, of, a lot of my students, when they play this, they play it really nicely, but all of the long notes and all of the ties, they're all just a random length. So they guess how long they last for, and they don't actually accurately count. What makes the counting so difficult is Nothing really lands on the first beat of the bar. Everything's tied over, and sometimes you've got two or three different note lengths all tied together. And again, trying to work out how many beats it all lasts for can be quite tricky. Like I've said in a lot of my other videos about counting long notes and counting rests, obviously the note length matters how long it lasts for. But the way you think about it, if you think about it in a different way, it'll really help you play it. So instead of actually counting how long a note lasts for, if you think about where in the bar the next note happens, then fitting it together and getting it together with your accompanist when you're adding the piano part to this piece becomes a lot more easier. A lot of these notes, you tie over onto beat number one and then you move. Sometimes you move on the A, the semiquaver of beat one, and sometimes you move on the and of beat one, and sometimes you actually move on beat number two. So holding those notes on and you're counting and then once you've got to beat number one, knowing when you move afterwards is really important to get it all locked together with your accompanist. So just before you start this section, you've got that D pause. I think the easiest way to get this together with your accompanist, if you just hold that D on for three beats in the new tempo, so you're going to be holding it D, ba -dum, da -dum, da -dum. so you hold it on for three beats and then the accompanist actually plays on the first beat of the 3-4 bar, which is your tied over note. So hold it for three beats, and then the accompanist plays on your tie, and then you can carry on for the rest of the piece. So it's a nice easy way to get it synced together with your accompanist nice and easy. So again, it's all nice and slurred, it's all nice and smooth, nice and quiet, pianissimo. That octave G leap at the end is really tricky, making sure your um, rhythm and counting is super, super accurate. So as with the first section, those grace notes in bar 22 and 3, they need to fit exactly between the notes. So this is how that bit sounds without the grace notes. And then with the grace notes. So the core notes are in exactly the same place and you're fitting the grace notes in between them. In bar 25, I would always advise, can everyone mark an F sharp on that high note? Because that's all one that a lot of people miss when they're playing this piece. So F sharp on that high note. That one's accented. So 
Again, it's not a real harsh March style accent. It's just slightly harder tongue to give the note a little bit of a lift. So you'll notice when I play through, I stop clicking. I'm going to explain the row bar in a second. So just watch out for that. So I'm going to play from bar 27 with that nice row. And because we're slowing down, there's actually not that much difference between the quavers and the triplets in that row bar. So you'll notice one and two and three and a one. So a nice even writ, written row, pretty much the same thing. Slight differences, but I'm not going to get into there now. Into that now. So slight slowing down, nice and gradual. So the transition between the quavers and the triplets just flow nicely into each other into the last bar. So that's pretty much it. Just make sure your counting is really, really accurate on that second half of the piece, and you'll it'll all magically fit with your accompanist when, when you rehearse before your exam. So the next piece used to be on the trumpet syllabus, it's on some of the other uh, brass instrument syllabuses, it's uh, Chanson Bohème, I really like this piece, it's nice and stylish, and it's got some of those faster semiquaver rhythms to get your fingers working nicely. So let's just talk the piece through quickly, we've got one flat in our key signature, so B flat, first valve, nice and easy, we're in 3-4 time signature, and the piece starts on the and of beat number 3, so 1, 2, three and one so it starts on the and of number three um, allegretto which is sort of fast-ish tempo so it's the same speed as the second section of Solvig song light and bouncy there's no style markings but it is a light and bouncy piece so again there's lots of articulation markings make sure you're following those exactly generally if the piece is slow and smooth then you have a little bit more leeway for your interpretation so if you've seen a lot of my other videos if it says dolce which means sweetly or espressivo or tranquille or cantabile, anything that means sort of in a singing style and it's a nice slow piece, then slowing everything, I find, nearly always gets you the best effect for that piece. In anything that's medium tempo or fast, generally, with there's hardly any exceptions, if you do exactly what it says on the music, you'll be playing in the right style. I'll quickly whiz through the first section of uh, Chanson Bohème. There's not really much to say here, just counting your rhythms and getting your fingers nicely coordinated on those semiquavers will really help. to talk about after I've played that. So you've got your writ at the end of that section and you've got your pause. So your writ you're going to slow down nice and gradually, you're going to hold your pause and then you'll finish the phrase off with that low C sharp and D. You'll notice that I follow the tongue in exactly, so light and bouncy quavers, dum 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 sort of style, really smooth slurred notes. Nothing was harsh, it was all light and sort of playful in style. A couple of things to mention as well, there's quite a lot of accidentals that follow through the bars. So if you have a look in bar 14, there's E flat at the start of the bar and the E flat carries on for the whole of the bar. The semiquaver rhythms, just make sure you're pressing your fingers down nice and rhythmically, nice and evenly, and the semiquavers flow nicely. If you need to practice those semiquavers four or five times to get them nice and neat and tidy, then you can do that. What I would advise, whenever you're practicing a group of semiquavers, always play the note afterwards as well. So you play the four semiquavers you're working on and the next note. It just works musically a little bit better. So on the first line, I'll play you those semiquavers. So I'll play the four semiquavers and the note afterwards. So I'm playing it nice and slowly to start with. Really pressing your fingers down nice and fast. until you're really happy with your fingers moving nicely. A couple of other little techniques to practice these semiquavers. You could play it in various styles. You could tongue them and getting your tongue and your fingers synced up nicely. And then when you take your tongue in out, it should help with your finger coordination. You could always change the rhythm as well. 
So I'm playing it with the long note first, so it's basically a sort of dotted quaver, semi-quaver rhythm. It helps every other valve movement be really fast. And then if you do it the backwards way, so you start off with the semi-quaver. Then you've practiced each pair of notes in a fast way, and those longer notes in between just give you a little bit more time to think. So then when you go back to playing it normally, you've practiced each pair of notes faster than you need to, so when you add it up, then you'll get a nice smooth result at the end. That same method works for all of the semi-quaver patterns in this piece. So whether it's the first bar of the second line or these semi-quavers which we'll talk to in the second half of the piece. So the second half of the piece starts in bar 22. Um, accidentals, just watch out for those. There's some A sharps in this bit. So first valve, it's the same note as B flat is an A sharp. And you've got some G sharps, F sharps and D sharps. You should all be familiar with those by now. So D sharp and G sharp is two and three, F sharps on second valve. And there's some C sharps on one and two as well. So this is the second half of bar 22. So it's louder and a bit more proud than the first half, but the style stays the same. It's relatively light and bouncy. And again, all those semi-quaver patterns, if you need to go through and practice each one individually, using the same methods I talked about earlier to get them nice and clean, it might take you 10 attempts on each one, but that's time really well spent to get the flow of this piece in the right place. So that's pretty much it. It's no longer on the trumpet grade five syllabus, but it's a good piece to practice because it's nice and stylish and it's a relatively famous tune. Right, okay, we've come to the last piece on the grade five syllabus. It's Raiders March from uh, Indiana Jones. Really famous piece. However, it is one of the more difficult pieces on the grade five syllabus. So you might be asking yourself, why is that? Well, it's quite long and it's quite high and it's quite loud, it's quite tiring and it's quite fast. So there's a lot of things all bunched together which make this piece quite a tricky tricky piece. The main tune is relatively easy. If you have a look at the first repeated strain, you don't have to do the repeat in the exam, which is great, so you, that knocks a bit of time off the length of the piece, which really will help you in the long run. So make sure when you're practicing this piece, you go straight to the second time bar at the beginning. You'll end up playing that first phrase again when you do the, uh, the DS anyway. Let's get the theory out before I play some uh, bits of this piece. So there's no sharps or flats in the keychains yet, that's great. A lot of people try and play B flats in this piece for some reason, so there's no B flat, there's no sharps or flats in the key signature, so make sure you're playing your B naturals, especially on that first line, B naturals all the way through. All of the fast bars, like the one on the third line, and then the end of the fourth line and the fifth line, all of those are really nice valve patterns. So they might look really fast and difficult, but if you think about the valve patterns, it makes the finger work really, really easy. Tonguing wise, it's a march. So you're going to be tonguing everything really hard. So wherever your normal level of tonguing you'd say it was, you're going to up that slightly because it's a march. That means any accented notes are going to be really, really harshly tongued. Let's give that a nice crisp start of the note. So here's the beginning. Just one note on the phrasing in this piece. It's quite tricky because in the second time bar, there's no time to breathe. So the phrases are in a nice block, but they tend to like overlap or it sounds like they overlap so breathing is, is quite tricky so just watch out for your breathing generally if you can breathe after a long note that's a really good idea but again make sure if you've got to hold a note on for two beats and you need to breathe you need to hold it on for less than two beats and then breathe in the gap so the note after your breath is still nicely in time another note on where to breathe in this piece the phrases nearly always start on beat number four so if you need to breathe you need to breathe between beat number three and four. That way it will really help the flow of the piece and make sure all your phrase starts and ends are all in the right place. So here's the beginning. I'll go straight to the second time bar and I'll play up to somewhere around about bar 20. <laughs>
I'm sure you all recognise that tune. I was focusing on really nice hard, hard tonguing because it's a march and counting the phrases and making sure each phrase starts on beat number four and trying to fit your breathing in around the phrasings really helps with the flow of the piece. Let's talk about bar 16 with the upbeat. That's the first like difficult bar. So a couple of ways to practice this one. The first three notes, including the upbeat. So C, E flat and D. That's the bit that everyone makes a mistake on. The amount of times I hear It's too numerous to count. So that rhythm, you've actually played the rhythm of the C and the E flat maybe 13, 14 times up to that point. And then that one, because you're thinking about the faster notes in the bar afterwards, instead of playing ta, 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 people play ta, ta, ta. And play two crotchets instead of a dotted quaver, semi quaver. So playing that rhythm four or five times before you practice anything else will just make sure you preempt your potential mistake. So the upbeat to bar 16, just three notes, play it four or five times. So just to get that really ingrained in your head, so when you add it to the next bar, you're not gonna make a mistake on those rhythms. Let's talk about that bar, starting on the D, bar 16. So there's a nice little valve pattern. So first, open, second, open, first, open, second, open, first, open, second, open. So the valve movement is the same thing three times. The only difference is the first two you go down and play G's and F sharps, and then the last one, it's C's and B's. It's the same valve movement, but the pitching is slightly different. So again, playing it nice and slowly, and just thinking about your valve patterns. So getting your valves in the right place, and then making sure on the last one, you change your pitch to the C's and B's, is really, really useful. And then once you're happy with that valve movement, if you add the C and the E flat, which you practiced earlier, to it, then hopefully you'll have the right rhythm and some nice tongue and valve coordination. So like I always say, practice it slowly first. Use your metronome. I know I don't always use the metronome when I'm doing these videos, but having the click in the background is really disrupting. But when I practice normally, I always practice with the metronome. It stops any guesswork. You know you're playing exactly at the right time. And that means when you start fitting it in with the rest of your band or orchestra or ensemble, you know you can play it at a certain speed and you know you can play in time. If you can't play with your metronome clicking at you and you find it difficult to be in sync with your metronome whilst it's making a click, as soon as you turn it off and you try and rely on your internal metronome, if you can't play it with it clicking at you, then the chances of you playing it with your internal metronome are slim to none really. So first of all, practice it with your metronome, playing it nicely in time, and then you can turn your metronome off and then you stand a way better chance of playing it in time with your internal metronome going off silently in your head. Just make sure, once you practice it slowly, you need to get it up to the right tempo. So let's, let's talk about the tempo of this piece. Marches are usually 120 beats per minute. So that's the uh, tempo you're aiming for. If I, if I just grab my metronome, 120 is this speed. So you need to be able to play those bars. So that's the tempo you're aiming for, 120 beats per minute. If you play the main tune at that speed, then that's the speed it should be. If you're struggling and you, your tongue in is, is, not, is unable to keep up, then you need to go and do some tongue in practice away from the piece with some easier notes, with, some, with no valve movements, just on one note, practicing those rhythms. And then once your tongue in can go at 120 beats per minute, then you can start adding your fingers in, adding the notes, adding the pitch changes. Then you're not wasting your time practicing the pieces when it's your technique that's your limiting factor. The minimum tempo, so you're aiming for 120, the minimum tempo, if you go to 112, I know it doesn't sound like a big difference, but it does make, it does make a difference. So this is the same rhythm at 112. slightly slower and it just gives you that extra little bit of thinking time. That bit of time helps you get your tongue in and your fingers nicely coordinated. So like I've said in many of my other videos, your fingers always follow your tongue in. So you set your tongue in up, ta 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 and then your fingers have got to follow that. If you wait for your fingers to move and then say the te for your tongue in, then the rhythm's all going to be disjointed 
and it definitely won't flow as well as if you do it the other way around. So that's that first section over and done with. The main tune is actually not that bad, it's just these little little tricky bars with the semi quavers that need, need work. Practice it with the metronome, do it slowly, work your way up, practice your tongue in separately if you need to and it'll be fine. So the next one is bar 25 with the upbeat. So again, this is where that pattern recognition comes in quite a bit as well. So the whole of from bar 25 all the way through to bar 30, it looks really difficult, but actually it's the same thing three times and then another thing once. Within that, the patterns are the same thing twice and one different. So if you actually look at how many valve patterns there are in those bars from bar 25 to 30, there's only actually three or four different valve patterns, but they just repeat in each phrase a few different times. So let's talk about bar 25 with the upbeat. I would, again, I would always advise playing the first three notes, as we did earlier, just to make sure that rhythm's right. And make sure this one's got an E natural, not an E flat. And then you can practice bar 25 starting on that high F. Valve pattern for this one, it's first, first, one and two, first. That pattern happens twice. So first, first, one and two, first. First, first, one and two, first. And then the second half is first, second, first, second. Ta, 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 ta. Then that whole chunk of music, that repeats three times. There's one slight variation each time. From the F, it repeats exactly. The only difference is the first version is you've got that introduction. And then the other two repeats, you have you have the two C's instead of the uh, D, E and F. But the bar that starts on the F is exactly the same each time. So I'll just play you those three bars. Really useful. The long note, make sure you breathe on beat number four. And then play your semi quavers on the and of four. That will really help you when it comes to that longer phrase at the end. So this is the upbeat to bar 25. For a second so you can hear it's the same thing three times it's just with a slight variation on the introduction to each bar the last bar where i stopped this is where the next valve pattern comes in so you've got second two and three open two and three and that happens again second two and three open two and three and then the last bit is second second first open so again the faster bars they're split up into the first half is two things that are the same and the last half is, is slightly different. So I'll play you from bar 30 this time. And it finishes on that nice high G for nearly two whole bars. So just finally, once you practice each of those bars separately, add in those last few bars together. So that's from bar, the upbeat to bar 29 through to that high G. That just helps with your breathing. So a nice big breath and you're aiming to do the whole thing in one breath. We go back to the beginning and take our coda. So I'm going to quickly play from the upbeat to bar eight and I'll take the coda. Couple of notes in the coda, the rhythm that is ta 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 ta, and the rhythm that is ta 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 ta, they keep switching around. So if you have a look at the MF in the coda, the low C's, the first one is ta ta ta. The next bar on the F's, it's ta 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 ta. Then the next bar is back to ta 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 on your low C's, and then the next bar ta 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 ta. So those rhythms keep switching around. Make sure you get those rhythms in the right place. Again, breathing between beat number three and four throughout the whole coda is really, really useful. I took a breath before that high G, just so I can get it a nice, powerful high G out there as well. So that's pretty much the whole piece. I'm just gonna talk about one final way you can practice the difficult bars that sort of eliminates your fingers and practices your tongue position and your accenting 
notes and your just tonguing in general. So I use bar 17 as the example. We've got the D's to the G's. We can eliminate that and just use C to G. So we could use this, you could do use the rhythm, but change the notes so it's all on open valves. So that's practicing now. Ti ta ta ta, ti ta ta ta, ti ta ta ta. That will really help. So you you get your tongue in really perfect, and then you add your add your fingers to your tongue in. Nice and easy. Same thing in bar twenty five. Instead of doing it on open, you can do the whole thing on first valve. And then you can add your fingers to that. So you can make sure you're going accent in your high F with a nice T tongue position, ta 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 for your B flat, T for your high Fs as well. And then when you're playing your Ds to finish with, it all depends on your you individually. You can either it's either a ta or a T or, or somewhere in between. So T ta 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 T ta 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 T ta ta ta. So somewhere in between a T and a ta for your Ds. So that's pretty much it for all the grade five pieces. The style of the music is really important. Solfic song, really smooth, really nice, cantable in a singing style. Chanson Bohème, light and bouncy. And Raiders March, really proud in a marching style with really crisp tongue in. And you'll notice oh, there's a lot more techniques involved, isn't there? So especially in Raiders March, tongue in and finger movement, getting those synced up nicely, getting your tongue position in the right place because it's jumping around with the intervals. And also, again, the rhythms and the counting it's really important you get your rhythms and your counting right. For the, for the main reason is, you often practice these pieces on your own, and then when you come to practice with your accompanist, if your rhythms and your counting isn't quite right, trying to get you and your accompanist synced up together is really difficult. If you can play your rhythms and you can count everything really accurately, then when you play with your accompanist, it'll just magically fit together. So if you're holding all your notes for the right amount of time and you're not rushing your rhythms or you're not cutting notes short or adding extra beats on, in different places, then if it's rhythmically correct, it will fit together with your accompanist really, really easy. But if your rhythm is not quite right, getting it, getting it fit to, fitted together is, is really difficult. So that's all the exam pieces covered from grade winners. There's one more video to come, which is sort of the bridge between grade five and grade six. And then we'll have covered most of the pieces in grade winners, which I use when I'm teaching. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I'll see you soon.